Welcome to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. Today I am going to cover ACE inhibitors, really focus on mechanism of action, side effects, things you need to monitor with ACE inhibitors, as well as kind of give you a sense of some uh, real life things that uh, actually happen in, in practice. So classic examples of, of ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, uh, remember that P-R-I-L ending that can tip you off to an ACE inhibitor. Uh, Benazapril, Ramapril, Enalapril, Captopril, uh, lots of different uh, ACE inhibitors out there. Uh, their primary mechanism of action is they inhibit angiotensin-converting enzyme. And the ultimate kind of chain of events that happens from uh, angiotensin converting enzyme is that enzyme helps create angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. So if we block or prevent the production of angiotensin 2, we get less vasoconstriction. So with less vasoconstriction, those are those vessels kind of tightening up, we're going to drop blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors classically used uh, to help lower blood pressure in our patients with high blood pressure. Now side effects, cough. If you ever have a patient that has a kind of a dry, nagging cough, the first thing I do is look and see if they're on an ACE inhibitor. Now, most, you know, I would definitely say, obviously, you know, most physicians, most providers uh, that work with patients are going to know this fact. Uh, but I have seen it overlooked simply for the fact that, you know, I, I've worked with patients that are on 15, 20 plus medications and it, it may kind of get uh, lost in the, the shuffle, maybe with, uh, other things uh, that are, are going on medically. So anyway, if you ever see a patient with kind of a dry, nagging cough that doesn't seem to go away, doesn't seem to be related uh, to an infection or something short-term going on, definitely look to see if they're on an, an ACE inhibitor. That definitely could be the, the cause, probably the primary cause of medication-related cough. Uh, kidney monitoring. So ACE inhibitors can induce acute renal failure. It's rare, it's not very common, and patients who are on other meds that are nephrotoxic or kidney toxic may be at higher risk. So examples, NSAIDs, uh, diuretics, those are two classic examples of pretty common meds that can kind of work with the ACE inhibitor to really be hard on the kidney. So we need to monitor kidney function. Now, that's kind of complicated because the ACE inhibitors, uh, particularly in patients with diabetes, can help preserve kidney function in the long term. So the primary lab we're going to be looking at is creatinine there. And typically, if you see a, a rise in creatinine, 30% uh, or more, so most patients will be around one on average, give or take. And if you see a 30% increase, maybe go to 1.3 or, or higher, we definitely need to uh, relook at the ACE inhibitor and or any other medications they might be on as well that, that are uh, potentially harmful to the kidney. Next lab that you absolutely have to monitor is potassium. They can, ACE inhibitors can impact aldosterone and kind of reduce the amount of aldosterone. Aldosterone, in effect, in the body, helps lower potassium levels. It does a bunch of other things as well. And I'll talk more about aldosterone in when I talk about aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone. But if you remember, spironolactone and ACE inhibitors both raise potassium and spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist, hopefully that kind of helps you remember that ACE inhibitors 
and aldosterone antagonists can raise potassium levels. Those are the three probably biggest pearls I'd, I'd want you to remember. Um, highly, highly testable pearls there. Obviously, we can lower blood pressure too low in certain situations. Uh, so that is a, a potential side effect. So any type of you know dizziness and lightheadedness due to low blood pressure, that can certainly happen with ACE inhibitors as well. Going a little bit deeper here with ACE inhibitors, uh, African uh, Americans, patients of African descent may not respond quite as well to ACE inhibitors just due to their uh, genetic makeup. So certainly keep that in mind if you've got a patient who isn't responding uh, to the, the ACE inhibitor and the, the blood pressure lowering effect. Uh, ACE inhibitors are cousins to what are called ARBs. Uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Remember I talked about that angiotensin 2? Well, ARBs kind of work to block the effects. ACE inhibitors work to prevent uh, production of angiotensin 2. Using ACE inhibitors and ARBs, example being like Losartan, is not recommended to be used together. So if you ever see patients on those two classes together, uh, that's likely an error or we should, you know, ask or, or reassess that. One final note here about ACE inhibitors is they have a ton of what are called, called compelling indications. And these are disease states that the medication has basically shown additional benefit above and beyond blood pressure lowering effect. So a patient who's recently had a heart attack or following a heart attack oftentimes will be and or should be, depending upon the clinical situation, uh, put on an ACE inhibitor. Uh, patients with diabetes, another classic example where ACE inhibitors have a compelling indication, and like I mentioned, they can kind of preserve uh, that kidney function. CHF, another classic example. So congestive heart failure, ACE inhibitors have been shown to reduce mortality I wanted to mention a couple of drug interactions with ACE inhibitors. I kind of alluded to it a little bit talking about NSAIDs and diuretics. Those medications definitely can work with the uh, ACE inhibitors to cause acute renal failure. So definitely super close monitoring uh, in patients that are, are taking diuretics and NSAIDs uh, with ACE inhibitors, at least especially when initiating and or increasing doses. Uh, I have seen interactions happen with lithium. Uh, ACE inhibitors can potentially uh, raise levels of, of lithium. I have seen interactions with hyperkalemia. Uh, certainly ACE inhibitors used with aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone, which does happen occasionally in uh, CHF. That's a, a good example where I've, I've seen hyperkalemia from that. Uh, I have seen... Uh, rarely, uh, hyperkalemia with uh, trimethoprim, which is part of Bactrim, uh, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim, a common antibiotic used for uh, urinary tract infections and different things like that. So those two, the trimethoprim and the uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, can potentially contribute to uh, hyperkalemia. You'll want to take a peek and kind of see, you know, where that patient's at baseline as far as, you know, using um, kind of monitoring for that, that drug interaction. Target ranges of, of potassium are usually in the 3.5 to 5 or 5.2 range. That's normal. Hyperkalemia obviously will, will be above and, and in the 5 and mid to high 5s for hyperkalemia. In very, very severe situations, we can get up into the 6s. Uh, and that can potentially lead to some cardiac issues and things of that nature, which are obviously um, pretty scary if we get potassium uh, up into the, the sixes or, or higher. So I think that wraps up the clinical pearls on ACE inhibitors. Uh, if there's something you feel like I missed or if you'd like you know, more detail about specific things, uh, certainly feel free to, to reach out and uh, leave me a comment at real life pharmacology.com 
and I can try to maybe uh, incorporate other things as we go as well. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you take care and have a great rest of your day.